Добрый день. Good day, everyone. This lecture is introductory. We will talk about the study of the subject life safety and how it can help us in practice. What are the classification of hazards? How do the concepts of danger and risk differ from each other? We will find out why the risk may be acceptable for us. Let's look at how risk management is carried out. Together, we will study how external and internal factors can increase the level of risk and learn how to take these factors under control. The final part of the lecture will be devoted to information security. We will talk about the protection of your personal information and about the threats that lie in wait for us on the vastness of the World Wide Web. Take care of yourself. Life safety studies the dangers that occur in the environment and develops measures to avoid them. Look at the drawing. This woodcutter is trying to turn on a chainsaw. Do you think he is safe? I think not. If he turns it on, he risks getting seriously injured. The subject, life safety, allows us to learn more about the dangers and think about how to prevent them. According to statistics, all accidents mainly occur for three reasons. 75% of accidents are the result of human error. 15% of accidents are caused by faulty equipment. And only 10% of accidents are the result of exposure to adverse environmental factors. On the example of car accidents, we can say that 75% are due to breaking of traffic rules. 15% are due to car malfunctions and 10% are due to ice on the road, fog or rain that interfere with traffic. And why is this important? Well, if you know what dangers exist and think about how to avoid them, we can prevent 75% of all accidents. The famous psychologist Abraham Maslow has a very interesting theory about human needs. According to his theory, human needs have a clearly defined hierarchy, like the pyramid that you see in the figure. On the first level are the physiological needs, sleep, food, water, and sex. These are basic needs. At the second level is the need for security. A person should not be afraid of anything. The third level is the need for love and belonging to a group. The notion of love should be quite clear but the notion of belonging to the group may mean belonging to a group of students like yours. There may be a club or a political society. A person needs communication. A person likes to be in a large group among his own. The fourth level is the need for recognition. That is, a person wants not just to be a student, but the best student. Not just a doctor, but the best doctor. Not just a member of a political party, but a person of position, like the president. The top of the pyramid is self-realization. A person gets what he wants, what he has been striving for all of his life. The most difficult thing in this pyramid is that a person can move to another level only if he has no problems at the previous level. So if a person does not feel safe, he has not passed the second level, and if he will not be able to pass the other three. Therefore, security is extremely important for our self-development. All sciences and all academic subjects are related to other sciences and other academic subjects. Life safety is closely related to hygiene, labor protection, ecology, civil defense, ergonomics, psychology, and physiology. Danger is a phenomenon, process, or object that is potentially dangerous to human life or health. An example of the phenomenon can be lightning strike. Gorenje is an example of this process. Objects can include falling bricks. There are two main principles of ensuring security, technical and organizational. Technical is more expensive. Technical means include electric fuses, motion sensors, which will turn off the device if a person enters a dangerous zone. The organizational principles of ensuring security are simpler and more profitable. These include training. If a person knows about the threat and knows how to protect himself from it, he is safe. That is, 
Your study of the subject life safety also refers to the organizational principles of ensuring security. There are several classifications of hazards. By origin, it can be natural, for example, a volcanic eruption or a tsunami. Man-made, like an explosion at a nuclear power plant. Social, for example, war. Based on the nature of the hazard, a person can be affected by harmful physical factors, for example, high temperature. Chemicals, for example, a person can be poisoned with chlorine. Biological, such as viruses, bacteria and fungi, and can also be psychological. As you know, psychological injuries harm our health no less than physical injuries. There is also a classification by localization. Threats can be located in the lithosphere, like earthquakes, hydrosphere, like floods, the atmosphere, like hurricane, and in space, like the fall of a satellite, part of a rocket or a meteorite. There is also a classification based on the results of exposure to harmful environmental factor. Such exposures can cause fatigue, illness, injury, or even death. This is not a complete list of classifications as there are many more ways by which we can classify hazards. Risk is a quantitative assessment of the danger. The higher the risk, the greater the probability of a particular danger. In the last century, the complete, absolute absence of risk was considered security. Nowadays, however, all countries use the concept of acceptable risk. According to this concept, the environment is always potentially dangerous and safety is not the absence of risk. Security is simply the absence of unacceptable risk. In other words, there is always a minimum acceptable risk that we are ready to ignore. Let's consider this picture. Here, we see a tiger in a cage. But are we absolutely safe from this tiger? Not really. If the cage is not strong enough, for instance, the tiger can break it and attack us. But this risk is low. This risk is acceptable. If the tiger is outside the cage, however, this is already a high, unacceptable risk. Then we are in imminent danger. Unfortunately, our security depends on how much money we are willing to pay for it. This relationship between risk and money was noticed in 1967 by the scientist Philip Farmer. So let's say you bought a new apartment and you need to put a door in this apartment. If you want to spend little money, you will buy a thin wooden door. You have spent a little money and your security level is low. This door is easy to break down. If you can spend more money, you will buy a door made of thin iron. The level of security is higher, but the level of monetary cost is also higher. If you have a lot of money, you can put a door made of thick iron, a video camera, or hire a guard. Your security level will increase as much as you are willing to pay. The amount of money in your bank or in your bank account determines the level of security of your apartment and determines the level of risk of theft. Examples of acceptable risk. In the heavy industry of the Russian Federation, six out of 1,000 workers die on the job. In our neighboring country, Ukraine, one employee of a nuclear power plant out of 100 employees is exposed to a high or above normal dose of radiation. And this is not considered a violation of the radiation safety standards. More examples of acceptable risks. Do you know what dietary supplements are? Changes in the taste and color of the product allow it to be stored longer, but unfortunately, they are harmful to health. One person out of 100,000 people gets health problems associated with the use of dietary supplements. It can be allergy, gastritis, or cancer. But one case out of 100,000 is considered an acceptable risk from the point of view of the World Health Organization. Another example is that one person out of 400 loggers in America dies within four years of work. This is also considered an acceptable risk. Thus, the level of acceptable risk is determined by political, economic, 
technical and social reasons. Risk management. Look at the picture. The electrical outlet is damaged. Question one, is it dangerous? Of course it is. Question two, can you reduce the risk? Yes, you can fix the socket, but this risk will also not be zero. Even a serviceable outlet can be overloaded or filled with water. That means there remains a small level of acceptable risk. Question three, if there is a short circuit and a fire, how can you minimize the consequences? Easy, you can keep a fire extinguisher at home. You should not install the outlet next to the water tap and you should not store flammable substances near the outlet. The point is, there is nothing too complicated about risk management. The level of risk may depend on external or internal factors. An example of external factors is ice on the road, which creates a high risk of car accidents. Most often, internal factors create problems for us. A common example of problems related to internal factors is the analyzer defect. If a person has poor eyesight, if a person has poor eyesight or poor hearing, the risk for him increases significantly to, for example, get a car accident. To prevent this, every person who wants to get a driver's license must undergo a medical examination. If his eyesight or other health problems do not allow him to drive, if his eyesight or other health problems do not allow him to drive, such a person will not receive a driver's license. And you should not consider this a violation of human rights. In fact, it is the protection of this person and other people nearby. Another internal factor on which a security depends on is memory. Memory is a process that allows us not only to save information, but also to access it at the right time. Unfortunately, we tend to forget. After listening to this lecture, the next day you are likely to remember about 40% of the information from the lecture. In about a week, you'd remember only about 20%. And by the end of the year, from 3 to 5% of the information will remain in your memory. Forgetting is a normal process, but it threatens our security. If we remember the danger, remember how to avoid it, then we are protected. If we forget this information, then we're at risk. Therefore, safety specialists usually give lectures at workplaces every year. Every year, again and again, to prevent forgetting. Of course, memory can be developed. If you are interested, you can find many methods of developing memory on the internet. Any form of study, especially at our university, also promotes the development of thinking and memory. Every year, your memory will get better and it will become easier for you to learn. This is ensured by training and regular study. Another process on which our security depends is attention. Attention is the ability to concentrate on a single object. It is very difficult for a person to keep several objects under control at the same time. From the point of view of physiology, attention creates a zone of excitement in the cerebral cortex. The area around is surrounded by a breaking zone. As a result, we clearly perceive the object to which our attention is directed but we perceive other objects that our attention is not directed at a worse rate. Look at this drawing. The driver's attention is directed at the woman. As a result, the driver does not perceive well what is on the road. This can lead to a car accident. In conclusion, in the zone of potential danger, our attention should be directed to a possible source of threat. When crossing the road, try to remove the mobile phone from your ear and look around. Because, in this case, the attention directed at the mobile phone creates a threat for you on the road. Attention can also be trained. This drawing is designed to train children's attention. How many animals do you see in this picture? This is a child's example, but there are also methods for training attention for adults. Our security also depends on perception. 
Perception is a reflection of the picture of the world in our consciousness, built with the help of information received from our senses. Unfortunately, the information is not always correctly interpreted and the reflection may not be accurate. Look at this slide. Our perception allows us to see the same thing in different ways. What is shown on the left? Someone sees two faces and someone sees a glass. On the right is a portrait of a woman. But is she young or old? It also depends on the point of view. We can sometimes see the danger but not perceive it as a danger. For example, a father and a son are standing near the road and see a big red car driving at a high speed. The father sees this as a danger and the little son may perceive the car as a big bright toy and he can even run to it. The conclusion is that, if possible, we should perceive this world really with all its threats. There are positive and negative emotions. From the therapist's point of view, Positive emotions have a good effect on human health and accelerates the patient's recovery. Negative emotions are bad. They contribute to gastritis and hypertension. They are harmful to our health. But this is only the point of view of the therapist. From the point of view of our security, all kinds of emotions, both positive and negative, increase the level of risk for us. Why is this? Emotions reduce attention. For example, let's talk about the bus driver. If the bus driver is under the influence of strong positive emotions, let's say he's thinking about his girlfriend. This will transfer his point of attention from the road to pleasant memories. Accordingly, this will increase the risk of an accident. If the driver is under the influence of a negative emotion, for example, remembering a conflict with the boss, the driver is the same, at risk of an accident. Conclusion, if there is at least some possible danger near us, it is best for us to keep our emotions under strict control, regardless of whether they are positive or negative. Security also depends on our will. For example, the construction of a house. You know that the area where people work is potentially dangerous. Heavy objects may fall. But if you could take a whole quarter to bypass the construction site, this is the time and it requires effort. If you have the willpower, you will walk another block on a safe road. But if a person is lazy and weak-willed, he will take a shortcut through the danger zone and he may get injured. The will is very important for a person. For example, a medical university diploma is your future security, including financially. To receive this diploma, you need to show willpower. Get up early in the morning, go to classes, read a textbook in the evening. And I wish you good luck with all of this. Our society also depends on our temperament. There are four types of temperament. Melancholic, choleric, phlegmatic and sanguine. People are divided into four temperaments according to two characteristics. The first sign is emotional stability. Emotionally stable include phlegmatic and sanguine. Melancholic and choleric are emotionally unstable. The second sign is the direction of a person's attention. If a person is an introvert, his attention is directed inward to his own problems. But if a person is an extrovert, his activity is directed outward. Extroverts are choleric and sanguine while introverts are melancholic and phlegmatic. In the same situation, people with different temperaments will react differently. Look at the drawing. A man is sitting on a bench. He puts his hat on the bench next to him. The other man did not notice the hat and sat right on it, and the hat got rumpled. You see the different reactions. The choleric reaction is aggression. The phlegmatic man did not betray the significance of what had happened. The melancholic fell into depression and the sanguine man found a reason for a new joke. Temperament is a basic characteristic of our nervous system. We are born with a certain temperament and die with the same temperament. Temperament is only the basis of our character. 
our character is built on the foundation of temperament. Character is the sum of individual psychological characteristics of a person that determine his behavior and relationship with other people. In childhood, parents help us form our character. In adult life, we can do it ourselves. We can work on our shortcomings and correct them. Why is character important to our security? For example, you will be doctors, but you will remain people. You will live in society. If you treat people, if you treat your patients well, you will be able to get help and useful information from them. Among your patients will be police officers, judges, bank employees, and so on. But if you are the owner of a bad, conflicting character, you can forget about help from other people. A good, friendly, non-conflicting character is the key to your safety in society. Stress. Every therapist will tell you how stress is bad for your health. First of all, for the cardiovascular system. But from a security point of view, stress can be a very useful thing. Stress is a protective reaction of the body. Stress helps us to overcome difficulties and dangers. Stress triggers a fight or flight response. The most important thing is that stress does not last too long and stops after you solve your problem. Nothing raises your performance like stress. Another important thing for us is motivation. We need to know the answer to the question, why are we doing this? What do we study for, for example? Motivation can be external or internal. Extrinsic motivation is a situation when you don't want to do something, but your parents or boss force you to do it. Internal motivation is if you want to do something yourself. Accordingly, it is better to work with internal motivation. Motivation can be positive or negative. Positive motivation is if you want to get something as a result. For example, to earn more money or get a diploma. Negative motivation is when you are afraid to lose something. So for example, you are afraid of being expelled from an educational institution or you are afraid of getting a fine. Of course, you will achieve great results if you work with positive motivation. A tip for you. If you want something that doesn't work out for you, try to find internal positive motivation for yourself and you will succeed. Information security. Now you think that the most expensive part of your smartphone or laptop is the smartphone or laptop itself. But when you start working, when you have a patient's database, when you collect material for scientific work, you will understand that the information on the device may cost much more than the device itself. If you don't understand it, then you are doing something wrong. There are also unpleasant situations when the information you have lost can return to you in the form of a letter from a blackmailer. The point is, this information on your device needs to be protected. These are some tips for protection of personal information on a computer or smartphone or tablet. There must be a password when you turn it on. Do not leave the computer unattended when it is turned on. When you leave the office, someone can sit at your desk and read or copy your information. Therefore, it is best to activate a screensaver with a password on your computer. Another very important tip is to use only legal software. If you buy illegal copies, be prepared for the fact that they contain pre-installed virus programs that will steal your passwords and other information. I understand that software updates are sometimes very annoying or take a lot of time and require spending money and traffic. But updates allow us to protect our information. Updates eliminate software code errors and prevent viruses from gaining access to our information. It is also very important to use an antivirus program. There are many free versions of antivirus programs. For example, Windows Defender, which is available by default in all legal copies of operating systems. There are other programs such as Bitdefender Free, Avira Free, AVG Free, Cloud Panda, and others. 
And of course, be careful with the links and files that other people send you. They may contain harmful program code. Creating a secure password is not easy. The password must be long. Creating a secure password is not easy. The password must be long. It is best that it contains at least eight characters. And of course, the password must be unpredictable. It must contain large and small letters, numbers and special characters as well. The worst idea that can come to your mind is to use your name or birthday instead of a secure password. Of course, you need to use a separate login and password pair on each site. But then there is a problem of how to remember all these dozens of usernames and passwords. There are several options with their own advantages and disadvantages. Many users store information in the browser. This is a bad idea because in the event of a computer malfunction, you will lose access to your websites and mailboxes. In addition, many viruses are specially designed to steal passwords from browsers. You can also store passwords in a text document inside your computer or on paper, but this does not guarantee the safety of your information. Recently, password manager programs have become widespread. The principle of operation of this program is that you type your username and password once in order to access this program. And this program already stores passwords and logins for all other sites inside itself. Unfortunately, setting a password to turn on the device does not guarantee the safe storage of your information. The information on the hard disk or memory card is stored in unencrypted form. Therefore, it is technically possible to steal a computer get a hard disk, connect it to another device and copy all the information. Thus, the most secure way to store information is to encrypt the hard disk or memory card. This is most easily done on the Android operating system. You need to go to the security, encryption section, enter the password and the entire device memory will be encrypted. If you have a professional version of Windows, then encryption tools are already built into it. If you have a home version of the operating system, you will have to use third-party programs. For example, the TrueCrypt program. This program allows you to either completely encrypt the computer's hard disk or create a protected folder that can be copied to a USB flash drive. In this folder, you can safely store personal information and access it through the encryption program that created this folder. You need to protect your information not only from intruders. It must be protected from accidental deletion. To do this, we recommend using the 3 to one rule. This means that the information is protected from loss if it is in three copies in two different places and one copy is made once a week. So for example, every Friday, you make a copy of important documents on your work computer and carry it home on a flash drive where you copy it to your, com where you copy it to your home computer. In this case, the information is located on three different media, that is, on two computers and one flash card. The information is located in two different places, at home and at work, and you make a copy once a week. If there is a need for you, you can make a copy even more often. A good solution for saving information is to copy it to the cloud. But then there is a question of your trust in the company that provides you with this cloud storage. The internet makes our life much easier, but it also creates a number of problems. For example, you can become a victim of fraud or get computer addiction. Here is an example of fraud. You can see the picture that you allegedly won an expensive smartphone for just $2. What do you think will happen if you press a key and try to transfer for this smartphone? At best, you will lose $2. And in the worst case, you will fill out some form and give the attacker your personal information. And the attacker can use a fake bank website and simply steal the money left on your credit card. A lot can happen, but you definitely won't get a smartphone. Three main rules of communication in social networks. The first rule is a minimum of personal information. If you talk too much about yourself on the internet, you can easily become a victim of fraud or robbery.
There are cases where people bragged about expensive things in their apartment and then sent photos from an expensive resort. Accordingly, the thieves conclude that there is money in this house and the owners are not at home. Of course, all the things from the house were stolen. The second rule is skepticism. Don't believe everything you are told. Perhaps they want to deceive you. The third rule is to think carefully before pressing the enter button and sending what you have written to the network. Perhaps you have written something superfluous. And of course, again, do not forget about the antivirus program. Sometimes, due to a reckless behavior in the virtual space, we can get real problems in the real world. For example, extremism. This word means propaganda of social, racial, national or religious discord. Hostility. It is not necessary to write offensive articles for this. Even by putting just a like, the court may come to the conclusion that you have contributed to the dissemination of extremist information. According to the law of Russia, propaganda of extremism, that's propaganda of social, racial, national or religious discord, is punishable by either a fine of up to 3,000 rubles or imprisonment for up to three years. According to the laws of Russia, insulting a state official, including on the internet, is punishable by a fine of up to 40,000 rubles or forced labor for 360 hours. According to the laws of Russia, insulting the feelings of believers is punishable by a fine of up to 300,000 rubles or a prison sentence of up to one year. And now we will talk about the protection of children on the internet. Question. At what age should children be protected? In Russia, at the age of three, 1% of children already have their own smartphones or tablets. By the age of five, half of children are owners of smartphones or tablets. And by the age of 14, almost everyone has these devices. Therefore, it is necessary to protect the child from the dangers of the internet immediately after buying these devices. What threats do children face on the internet in the first place? The first, of course, is an excessive passion for online games. That's about 33% of children. In the second place, content from the category for adults. It is viewed by 20% of children. 19% of children subscribe to paid services using their parents' credit cards. Next in the list is theft of passwords and accounts in social networks, loss of personal data, and so on. So, for example, in 2020, an eight-year-old girl using her parents' credit card spent almost $2,000 on purchases inside a computer game. Thus, Children should be taught the rules of safe behavior from the moment they buy a device for internet access. Children should know that virtual friends can actually turn out to be real criminals. Children should not distribute personal information, neither their own nor their parents. Children should not buy anything online without the approval of their parents. Recently, children have a lot of problems due to harassment from other people via the internet. That is because of bullying. In the Russian Federation, bullying is punished with a fine of one to three thousand rubles. In other countries, this may serve as a reason for prosecution. For example, in the year 2017, more than a thousand people were convicted of cyberbullying, that is harassment via the internet, in England alone. Currently, almost every operating system has built-in child protection. For example, in Windows, you can go to the settings and activate parental control. Thus, the child will have a separate login and password to turn on the computer. The program will track the time of the child's work at the computer. The program will monitor which sites the child visits and parents can create a list of allowed sites and block all others. Or parents can create a list of banned sites and allow everything that is not included on the list. We also like to share our photos via the internet. Many people take selfies, but unfortunately, some of the people even get killed because of selfies. During selfies, people could fall from a height, drown, 
get hit by a train, injure themselves with firearms, explode, smash cars, and so on. According to statistics, India ranks first in the number of people who die during a selfie. The Russian Federation takes the second place and the United States is the third. That's why I'm asking you very much. If you want to take a good selfie, make sure that you are safe. Unfortunately, dangers lie in the wait for us, not only on the internet, but also on the street. The consequences of the attack are not limited to physical damage and theft of a wallet. Any attack has serious psychological consequences. For example, ego stress. A person begins to think about what he did wrong and why this happened to him or why he is so unlucky and his self-esteem drops. A person may feel shame and disgust after an attack. And after an attack, many people develop what's called situational anxiety. So for example, if a person was robbed under a bridge, in the coming weeks or even years, he may feel anxious when passing by any bridge. And of course, the attack leads to subdepression and various psychosomatic disorders. Therefore, we must not allow ourselves to be attacked, but we must defend ourselves with the help of permitted legal means of self-defense. The simplest and cheapest of the legal means of self-defense are aerosols. Cans with natural and synthetic irritants are sold. They can be legally purchased at any gun store without a license. You are only required to prove that you are an adult by showing your passport. Unfortunately, the aerosol is easily blown away by the wind and it is also better not to use it indoors. Gas cartridges for the gun. Of course, they will be sold only with a license. A taser. They are also allowed to be sold without a license in any gun store. But in the Russian Federation, the voltage of a taser is limited to no more than 9,000 volts. The disadvantage of a shocker is that you need direct contact with the attacker in addition, through thick clothing, the taser may not work. Electric tasers are pistols that shoot a needle with wires. The range is about 4 meters and they are also absolutely legal in the Russian Federation and do not require a license. Pneumatic weapons are air pistols and rifles are considered sports. Pneumatic weapons. Air pistols and rifles are considered sports weapons in the Russian Federation. Therefore, you have no right to use them as a weapon of self-defense. This would be illegal. Pneumatic weapons can only be carried down the street, unloaded and unpacked. Pneumatic weapons can only be carried down the street, unloaded and packed. If the bullet diameter is not more than 5.5 millimeters, they are sold without a license. Weapons with rubber bullets. These are also sold only with a license. It can be legally used as a means of self-defense. Hunting weapons. A license is required for the purchase. It is forbidden to use these as a self-defense weapon. Transportation on the street is allowed only in a discharged, parked condition. A knife can be used as a self-defense weapon only if it is not a cold weapon. If the knife has a length more than 9 cm, the thickness of the metal from which it is made is more than 2 and a half millimeters. The angle between the butt and the blade is 70 degrees, so the knife is adapted for stabbing, and there is a guard on the handle that's for finger protection. This knife is considered a cold weapon and its use for self-protection will be illegal. If at least one of the signs of a cold weapon is missing, that is, the length is less than 9 cm, thin metal, not the sharp end of the blade, there is no protection for fingers. The knife is not considered a cold weapon. It can be carried on the street and it can be used for self-defense. If the knives are adapted for throwing, according to the Russian law, they are cold weapons. It is illegal to carry them on the street and use them for self-defense. In the Russian Federation, a telescopic baton or nunchucks are considered illegal weapons. Their use is punishable under the article of criminal code exceeding the necessary limits of self-defense. A baseball bat is considered sports equipment and it is allowed to use it for self-defense. Machetes 
An axe, for example, are not weapons under the Russian law. They are considered a tool, such as a screwdriver. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next lecture.